want us to stand together, lift your hands and let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you for a beautiful morning. The gift of life that we have every day. Just to wake up and to realize that we are into another new day. We pray that the Holy Spirit will take charge of our meeting today. That you'll speak to your heart, set people free from fear. Open our eyes that we might see Jesus for who he really is. We ask that you be lifted up, Lord Jesus, in our service. Bless every man, woman, boy and girl. The children who are upstairs having their class. We pray that everyone will feel the touch of God. Not one person will leave the same. Because you will make a difference in a person's life today. We ask it in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Thank you. Amen. My wife is in uh, Bangkok preaching right now. Yeah, she's, uh, she's a woman on demand. She's hot. And I'm glad I married a hot chick. It would be boring to death if I married. I mean, 37 years of marriage, she ought to be hot. Yeah. I'm just saying that. You all, you, you all are nice, great, fantastic. But she's there and she's preaching at a church there. And uh, I want to thank the Lord for all the busyness, you know, that's going on. It's all good, all good. We welcome you. We're so happy that you and your family are here. And we trust that God will touch you and bless you today. And yeah, there are so many things I'd like to say. I just want to thank our hospitality team, really, both here and in our KL church who are amazing in their work for God. I want to share something that might seem a little bit funny for some of you, but it's in the Bible. I'm talking about angels. And uh, I want you to look at your wife right now, and I want you to look at her and realize she is not an angel. <laughs> she is not. She is a princess. She's made in the image of God. The Bible tells us that angels look at mankind. Now, we are made from the ground. The Bible tells us. Angels are created beings. But they realize that you are made in the image of God. They admire you. Because you are a princess. You are a prince. Because you are a child of a king. And so angels are real. They are mentioned more than 300 times from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. Now, I'm talking about angels not because Hollywood has made a lot of movies and TV series and, you know, and all of that. I'm not talking about that because someone had an experience with an angel and wrote a book. I don't believe in angels because of what people say or people think or what Hollywood says. I believe in angels because of what the Bible has to say about them. And this is where you will never go into error. If you will stick to what the Bible says. Not somebody said, I saw and he said and the angel gave me a book and gave me some teaching. I can tell you right now that you don't have to believe in angels because of somebody else's experience. You can believe in God not because of somebody else's experience. Not because somebody said they saw God. Or they felt God. You can believe God for yourself. Because God doesn't need an interpreter. God doesn't need a mediator. You know, you don't have to go through your pastor to talk to God. You don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to go to some mediator. Talk to God for me. No, he is your father. He will talk to you face to face. He'll talk to you in your heart if you will listen. If you listen. If you want to. If you don't want to, you won't hear him. So this message has two edged. If you want what God has for you, you'll get it. If you don't want what God wants for you, you won't get it. Very simple. Amen. You don't have to be a genius to understand the Bible. That God works with people, touches people, shows himself real to people who desire it. Now on the subject of angels. As I've said before. We don't talk about this subject very often because they are just celestial beings. We don't pray to them. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever advocate prayers to angels. Nowhere in the Bible. In fact, every time an angel appeared and a man knelt down, he would say, stand up. I'm not God. Don't bow before me. I'm just a messenger sent by God to help you because you have a mission. 
And you can't do it on your own. So I am your assistant. I've come to help you. Never you will find an angel advocating worship. They will always point the attention to Jesus, to God, to his purpose. An angel that appears to you and accepts worship is definitely another kind of angel. I'll come to that in a little while. What are angels? Why are they created? What, is, what are their purpose on earth? Are there female angels? <laughs> well, Bible doesn't mention ever once a female-like angel. Angels are not those little cute little babies with their little bums sticking up, with little wings and a little halo. Somebody said, my wife is an angel. He said, she's up in the air always hopping about something. Anyway, that's a different. You didn't get it, that's okay. Sorry, right, forget it. You'll get it by lunch. Uh, so, they are mentioned in the Bible. Their purpose is to serve you. You cannot command an angel. Hey, angel, come serve me. No, they only take orders from their boss, who is God. But their purpose is to serve you. In Psalms 91, verse 11 and 12, the Bible says, For he shall give his angels charge over you. Isn't that good to know? That God has got his secret agents who are more powerful than the mafia or the secret service. What's that group that Sylvester Stallone leads? Ex Expendables. They are better than James Bond. You can put them all together. God's secret angels or agents, they are invisible, they are invincible, they are powerful, they can be seen if they want you to see them. Thank God there are a lot of things in the invisible world God has not opened our eyes to. Otherwise, you will be a fruitcake. They will have to take you and put you in a mental institution because right now what your eyes don't see there are invisible things all around us. I don't want you to start getting spooky, but I want you to understand that there are invisible beings all around us right now. Are there aliens, Pastor? How do they look like? As cute as E.T.? Or are they as scary as aliens? Are they like the predators? People have seen. Isn't it funny that the people who talk on documentaries, who say they saw alien beings and all that, they're always in a swamp and or in some cornfield and they all talk kind of funny. Yeah, my brother Jake and I, we were out cutting bait. We saw this big man, he was big. He saw this bright light and this guy will be like stone, really stone with big overalls. You never find a sharp executive walking down the streets of New York saying, yeah, I saw an angel, or I saw, I, I saw an alien. Never. It's always these swamp people drinking out of distilled alcohol higher than a kite in a boat that's half sinking saying, I saw Bigfoot walk right over there. Yeah, it came to my mama's house the other day. I wasn't sure whether it was my mama or was the Bigfoot. They both looked the same. Funny, isn't it? But the Bible does talk about angelic beings. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Psalm 34 verse 7. The Bible tells us, The angel of the Lord encamps are all around those who fear him. Watch this. There is a condition. You do not command angels. Just because you think, well, I'm a child of God? Now, nah. he says to those who fear him means respect God. People who honor God. They don't waste time with people who dishonor him. In fact, beware. There might be another angel standing next to you if you dishonor this God. They take it very seriously. They take God because he is their boss. They love him. I'm talking about good angels. We'll come to that in a little while. They love him. They worship him. They, they long to serve him. When they look at him, they, they smile, they dance, they sing. We'll see that in scripture in a little while. So when you mess around with their boss, like some people think, well, I can, you know, blaspheme God, da, 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 da. Now, if you didn't know, I understand. But 
how you know. So, you honor their boss. What is an angel? What are they like? I've had my personal experience with the angel once. I was driving. Debbie, my youngest daughter, was at the back of the car in a basket. <laughs> Those days we put them in a thing called a bouncer net. We didn't have baby's chair and all of that. I didn't have a car. I rented a car. And um, I was just starting out my ministry years ago. And it was the old road, you know, from, from Penang down to Klang. And it was all those winding roads. And Stella was sitting next to me. And we were going down the bend. And suddenly my car just spun out of control. It was a rented car. I knew over this side was a ledge. It, it was a ditch. I would have gone over it. My car spun for, I didn't have time. Sorry, people. I didn't have time for long, pious, religious prayers. How many of you know that when you're in deep yogurt, you don't have time for nice, re- oh God, who sits in the... I just shouted, Jesus! And my car spun around and stopped facing the way that I should be going. I tell you, I'm a black man, but that moment I went whiter. <laughs> I was so white. My knuckles and everything. My wife, she just, Debbie, nothing. Just looked around, was a nice pin. She thought, you know, my wife just sat there. And I knew that the angel of the Lord encamps about those who fear him. When you get up every day, you just said, God, I don't know what's ahead of me today. I live in a world today that's so unpredictable. But Lord, may your angels encamp around me. As I, go out, as I do dangerous work, we go out and preach in Vietnam and Thailand and all these places. And we've received threats and all of that. We said, Lord, if it's time for me to go, I'm more than happy to go. Otherwise, send your angels to encamp around us as we go out to do your work. Stella had an experience, my wife. And she went out, as usual, early days of our church, she went out visiting people. And then she got lost, you know. And she drove her little proton car into some quarry area in Port Clang. And her car got stopped. And there were these workers that were there. She didn't know what to do. Her wheel had gone in. And these guys started walking towards her. She said, out of nowhere, a car showed up. Four Chinese guys got out, pulled her car out of the ditch. And then got back in their car and she turned around to thank them and they were gone. Now I'm sharing these experiences. I'm sure some of you will say, you know, I was very lucky that day. I'm, I'm telling you right now, we don't realize that, that God is on our case. He knows how to take care of you. He knows how to protect you. And these angels will always, always channel you back to praising, thanking God. So what is an angel? Number one, angels are created beings. Psalms 148 verse 2 says, Praise him, all you angels. Praise him, all you hosts. Colossians 1 verse 1 says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things. See, he's talking about invisible things. And so occasionally, even in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, you will find an angel will appear to a person and allow that person to see other times you don't see. So God will lift our eyes every once in a while and realize that this angel, no, he's not a shining being. He's not always dressed in white. He's not always this gigantic figure. We don't know. Many times, the Bible says, they will look just like ordinary people. You would expect to see this glowing beam like mm, mm, mm. that might not be an angel. Because they'll come just as ordinary as you can ever imagine. But sometimes they will show you how great they are. In 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 16 and 17, it tells us about a situation where Elijah the prophet, you know, Elisha, was in his house and the armies of Israel against Israel. They came to fight Israel and they realized that Elisha was the one who was giving information because he was a prophet. He would tell the, the armies of Israel, this is where your enemies are. And they were wondering, who is this guy? How come the very hidden secret 
things we were having is disclosed by the captains of Israel. Who's been telling? Who's the leak? And finally they came down and they found that it was his prophet. How does he know? Let's go get him. And so they surrounded him, his house. And while he's in the house, his servant looks out and sees this huge army of shining metal and steel and big, huge stallions and warriors ready to take on this prophet. And the prophet said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He says, but my Lord. And then this is what Elisha says. So he answered and said, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the young man's eye. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. All around, ready for one signal from the man of God. And they would have blasted this army. Who are these angels? Number two, we realize, angels are without number. They are so many. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 says, But you have come to Zion, which is Jerusalem, the city of God, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Cannot be counted. What are angels like? Number three, angels have supernatural power. In Revelation 18 verse 21, it says, Then a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea. It's talking about the last days. And thus, with the violence, the great city of Babylon was thrown down and could not be found anymore. One angel. One angel. No name. One angel took one stone. It said a millstone. That's an old word for probably an asteroid. Smashed into the sea and wiped out two-thirds of the living population in the world to come. Talking about the future. Revelation 19 verse 17. Then I saw an angel, just one angel, standing in the sun. Now I want you to realize that your God loves you so much. That there are beings that he has created to fight for you. To stand. Why do we talk so fearful? About our business and what's happening to the economy and, and what are they planning to outlaw Christianity in this country. and Oh, they're trying to snuff us out. They're going to wipe us out. Why are you so fearful when you open your eyes and begin to look at the magnitude of what God has got in our defense in Jesus' name? I hear some Christians grumble and complain, I'm so frightened, I dare not do, I cannot serve God, I have no time. What God are you talking about? You go, you're talking about your small little ticky God that you are used to. This is a mighty God. And he sent angels to fight for you, to stand for you. The Bible, no wonder the Bible says, if God is for you, who can be against you? So the key is, is God for you? And once you know that, it doesn't matter what setback you might be going on, going through, smile. Here's an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather for the supper of the great God. They are into people coming back to God. In Revelation 20 verse 1 and 2, he said, I saw an angel coming down from heaven. Having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon. If you went to Liverpool in England, you'll find in one of the churches that has been restored after the Second World War. It was blasted. And it's a beautiful uh, Anglican church, I think it is. And they have a figurine. Huge outside as you come out of the church. A big, beautiful figurine of one angel. And under his foot, in chains like that, is the devil. You know, the devil's there. And one, the Bible says one angel. An angel. Not a host of angels. One angel is binding Satan. One angel. Is putting Satan, the devil, and bound him for a thousand years. Isaiah 37 verse 36 tells us this. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose in the morning, there were corpses all dead. One night, one angel, 185,000, even the expendables cannot expend that much. Don't mess around with God's angels in one night. 
took out, killed them one by one because they were planning to take out God's people. I wonder how many of us realize that, you know, on your missions and on your work and on... I'm not saying that your angels are there to baby. God didn't send maids, okay? Maids you hire. These are angels if you're in line with the purposes of God. If you're not in line with the purposes of God, forget about this message. If you're not into, well, I'm going to serve God, live my life for God, forget about this message. But if you decide today that you and your household will serve the Lord, you can be assured that He will cause His angels to encamp around about you. Number four, angels are God's ministers from heaven. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says this, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? The term minister in the government world simply means a person from or representing the government. You have the minister of transportation, the minister of education. So in other words, they are the government. When God says that these ministering spirits are sent to minister, it's talking about his governance. If you're involved in serving God, if you can say I'm part of the kingdom of God, I'm not just a lazy Christian sitting around to be spoon-fed, you know, a, a, a high-maintenance, low-performance person that's got to be patted on the back all the time. Will you come to church, please? We'd love you to come to church. Then forget about this message. This doesn't apply to you. In fact, don't pray that God will send you angels. Other kind of angels will come. Not these ones. These ones are for those who are government serving God, spirits of angels that will come. So we find when Daniel prayed, Michael, the angel came, the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel, Michael, the angel came and he fought the prince of Persia for 10 days. He is, was like the minister of defense. When Israel went through the wilderness, angels kept them day and night from the scorching heat to the shivering cold and gave them clothes and food. Angels kept them. They were called the minister of health and education and welfare, if you like. Angels were sent in the last days to gather people from all the four corners of the earth. We can call them minister of transportation. Whatever you want. What are you worried about? Why are you complaining about the ministers in Malaysia who might be corrupted and uh, so, you know, so, you know, somebody told me the other day, uh, I don't know whether statistically stated um, in one of these, uh, uh, well, you know, these, these things that, that check on nations, that Malaysia is the number one corrupted nation. We finally made it to number one. <laughs> Now, if you look at these statistics, then you will feel very discouraged. You, you know, you, you'd get angry with what's going on. You'd get all hurt. But realize, God has got His government. And you can't buy them out. They cannot be corrupted. They are meant to come to serve you and I. So we have an awesome source of protection and provision and power that's available to you and I. Number five, this is important. There are good angels and there are evil angels. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 says this. So the great dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceived the world was cast to the earth and his angels were cast with him. So, if there are good angels, then there are bad angels or Bible students will call it fallen angels. Just to throw something out to you. In the Old Testament, Jesus, who is God, appeared in the Old Testament. They would call him Lord. The, he, the Greek word is the theophonic appearance. Theos is God. Appearance. So God, in order for people not to die of a heart attack, he couldn't come down as God, so he had to come as man. And whenever they saw him, they knew he was God because he was different from the other angels. So God appeared to his people many times and assured them that he is for them. 
But you would find that Jesus would often walk with one or two angels, even in the Old Testament. We read about that. Now, today there are many people who will say, I saw an angel and it had light. Well, the Bible tells us Jesus is the light of the world. Any angel that appears to you and tells you to go worship something else apart from Jesus Christ is not the light of the world. Why am I saying that? Second Corinthians, sorry, yeah, Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 4. And it says this. Is this the one that we've got up there? Let's see. All right, here we go. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom you have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Hmm, that's not really what I wanted. I wanted the scripture that said, For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Can you find that for me somebody real quick? For Satan himself is transformed to an angel of light. Apparently I got the wrong scripture. I should have checked it throughout the week. But, sorry? Say, who said what? Somebody's going, peep, peep. Second Corinthians. Find. What's 14? 11, 14? Okay, let's try 11, 14. This is important because there are many people who say, I saw a light and the one who spoke to me was very bright. Pray. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Now, Jesus is the light of the world. So you'll find people who will come up and anything. Listen, I, I, love, I love Peter, for example. I'm not hitting out on Catholics or... Anybody, all right? So don't get into a defensive mode here. We love, I thank God for Catholics, Protestants, Methodists, Christians, can, you know, charismatic. All of us worship Jesus just the same. But I wouldn't be thinking of worshipping Peter because he, he never asked to be worshipped. He's just a man. In fact, I can identify with Peter. He was a bad mouth, cussing person who... You know, I mean, he, 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 one time when they came to arrest Jesus, he, he took a sword and he wanted to chop the Roman soldier's head and the soldier ducked and he cut the ears and Jesus took the ears and put it back. I, I mean, he's that kind of a person. And he never claimed to be a saint where you worship him. You don't want to put Peter on your dashboard so you can worship him. Mary is one of the best women that ever lived. But she was just a girl. And she was obedient to God. And she opened her womb for God to do a miracle, a supernatural miracle. And she conceived the Son of God. She's a wonderful person to be respected and loved and adored. But nowhere in the Bible does the Bible ever call us to worship anybody else but Jesus. The moment the angel or any angel or any prophet or anybody comes and tells you, well, you know, apart from Jesus, you ought to worship this, or you better trust in that. And so we've got all the cults that go on. And so you ought to beware, because Satan, people think Satan comes, you know, with two horns, and a, and a tight red underwear, and, and, and hoofs, and he's got a fork, and he's got a tail. And he comes up, that's the devil. No. He comes immaculate. He's dressed up really nice. He's a smooth criminal. And he's not going to come to you to... Now, the Bible tells us that when he fell from heaven, he took a third of the angels with him. So these fallen angels, people say, well, my uncle died and I saw him the other day and he said hi and all of that. Look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to hurt you emotionally. If you're into that, that's fine. But I want you to know when a person dies, they're absent from the body and they're gone into the presence of God or into some place. They will never float around. So what are these things that people often say they saw appearances or felt or saw some of these things? 
Well, the Bible is very clear. If things that are not clear in the Bible, don't worry about it. Amen. There are many gray areas in life we don't know. So people come up to me, you know, Pastor, the other day, uh, you know, this, this, this happened. And I get all those questions. And I will tell them, I don't know. How come you don't know you're a pastor? Yes. Don't you know that pastors don't know anything? But there are clear areas in the Bible where God is clear. Like how do you get saved? You get saved by no other name. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 4, you are saved by no other name except the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Clear. He doesn't give you any gray area about your salvation or how you're connected with God or who you are as a child of God. That you are bought with the blood of Jesus. Not because you are pious or you're religious and you paid money to the church and you helped an orphanage or you did some good work or you changed your name from Armagam to Andy Williams or you did something and went to Jerusalem and you got baptized in the Jordan River. Because of that now God has kept a special place for you in heaven no that's not what the bible teaches us the bible teaches us that we are saved through grace in jesus christ by his blood alone we have redemption through his blood now that's basic in the bible but what about this well, i don't know what i do know is that the bible tells us that there are good angels and that there are bad angels and bad angels will want to take your attention off from God. So how do I know that my experience was good or bad? Bible. Christian, are you reading your Bible? Or is it there in the cupboard somewhere? Only on Sunday you take it out. It still has all the dust marks there. Exact place you put it back every Sunday. And then you wonder, oh, I wonder why this doesn't work for me. It won't work for you. You've got to make it work in your life. So if you want healing, you trust the Lord and you say, God, you're the same God who healed people in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it says that the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. I claim your word. I claim your protection over my children, over my husband going out for work. He's been sent to another country or he's sent into a very difficult business situation. I pray that you'll give me the ability to be a good mom and a good dad and a good husband. There are scriptures here. And if you don't make this book work for you, it will not work for you. You can put it in your house, in your car, under your pillow so that you won't have bad dreams. It will not work for you. Only way it will work is that you make it work for you. So how do I know? Good angels or bad angels? Are they turning me away from Jesus and Jesus alone? Is it causing me to be distracted by some other ritual and some other law and some other uh, 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 observance and some other holy day? Do I have to start being extra pious? Now please, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I respect all of you from all your walks of life. All I'm saying is that anything that gets me back to suddenly, I come back with a Jewish hairstyle because I went to Israel and now I'm bunning up my hair like a Jewish mom because now I feel more spiritual and and I, I even have a little jewish candle stand in my house i have one and it's the menorah and so i feel a little bit more spiritual none of these things none of the why do christians put up with all these nonsense i'll tell you why because the bible says in the last days there will be doctrines of devils it'll get you off your focus on jesus and jesus alone can somebody say amen? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying, it's hard. This side, I'm trying to be the best and the nicest person I can be at this time. Alright, any message that comes to you outside of Jesus Christ and the teaching of the Word of God. Look, there are many good moral teachings. They're not wrong. They're very good. In fact, some of them, the principles are very good. In fact, some of them have better marriages than some Christians. They have better principles in business than some Christians. But the central theme of their life isn't Jesus Christ. And that itself tells you 
That is not what God is trying to say. Number three, number, number six. <clears throat> angel's purpose, evil angel's purpose, is to separate you from God. How do I know that? They'll try somehow to separate you from God. Romans 8 verse 37 and 38. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels. Why would angels want to separate you? He said, I'm persuaded that there are these things, but I'm not going to let any of these things. Oh, but pastor, suddenly I woke up and I felt this angel and he said, from now onwards, I should go and pick up a book by so-and-so because, he, you know, Mr. Smith saw an angel and he wrote a book and he's, so I, no, then you ought to realize that ain't from God. I like what D.L. Moody said one time. He said he'd been so, he's a great preacher in case you didn't know who he was those days. He said he would preach and preach and preach and many times, you know, he would face all kinds of things. And uh, he would cast out demons, so on and so forth. And then one day he was sleeping in a hotel and he heard some noise in his room. And he turns around and he sees the devil standing there. And he says, oh, it's you again. And he turns and continues to sleep. I want you to know, people who know God, do not fear these things at all. We don't give fear, oh, I felt, I, you know, I, neighbor's house is haunted, poltergeist, ghost story, hantu, pontiana, vampires, blood sucking, Flesh eating, we will such a craze today about movies like this. People like, I mean, they are scared spitless, but they'll still sit there and watch it. And then when they come to church, you know, they'll hear messages like this and they'll look at you like, and still go home and say, I don't know why I, I, I saw a white figure passing. I'll tell you who the. I'll tell you who that white figure is. <laughs> Causes you to be pinned down in fear. Even angels. Now this is what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. Evil's angel's purpose is to separate you from God. Galatians 1 verse 8. Even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel. Watch. Angels preach? No. Good angels will never preach. They always come to announce something, to bring a message. Guess who's supposed to preach? You. So if angels come to preach what? Any other gospel than what we have preached to you, let him be damned. That's what the Bible said, accursed. Why? Because there is salvation in no other. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. I said this just now. There is salvation in no other. There is salvation in... There is, nor is there salvation in any other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. And the man Christ Jesus. That's all. Period. End of story. No need other mediator. Number 7. We're going to close soon. Good angels draw you toward God. They always are praising God. That they, they just love it being in the presence of God. In, in Luke chapter 2, verse 15, or verse 13, let's look at that. And suddenly, this is Christmas time, and suddenly there was with the, uh, with the angel a multitude of hosts praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest. These angels were sitting, these uh, shepherds were sitting down and an angel come and said, guys, in Bethlehem, in such and such a place, the Savior of the world is born. And he says, while he's saying that, what happens? Angels come. And what do angels do? They glorify God. Never glorify man. Never glorify a church. Always glorifying God. Always. Fantastic. It tells us then, 
In Revelation chapter 5 verse 11, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. In other words, cannot be counted. And I want to just say to you people, angels in the presence of their God, He is altogether lovely. He's the darling of heaven. He's the one who died for all mankind. They love him. When they see him, they make a loud noise. I want you to know, church is supposed to be noisy. Because if you're not used to noise, you're not going to heaven because there's going to be too much noise for you to handle. And I'm sorry, angels won't be passing out as you enter heaven earplugs. I mean, their, their worship is not just irritating noise. I mean, it's noise that penetrates right through you as they look at Jesus and they fall in love with Him every second. It's loud. It's boisterous. And when you come to church and when you are quiet, we think somebody is dead. But God isn't dead. He's alive. You don't have to play the pious game in church. Angels dance, angels shout, they break down, baby. They get all excited about Jesus. They don't care about what anybody else is think. And if angels love God to such an extent, how much more should we love Him who are made in the very image and the very likeness of God? You never find angel taking any credit. They'll always praise God. Finally, I love this part. Angels carry messages from God. Okay. We find that in, even in Abraham's case, in the book of Genesis, we find that angels come to him and tell him a message. You're going to have, your wife is going to have a baby. He, 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 he says, but I'm a hundred years old. Everything that was once alive is dead. <laughs> uh, to put it nicely, come on, people, look at me. Don't don't pretend I don't know what I'm talking about. And his wife is 90 years old. She is dried up by the desert sun. They are both dead. I love it. I love it because here's the message: what is impossible with man is possible with God. When he comes to Mary, he looks at a young girl who hadn't had sex. She's a virgin and he says, you are going to have a child. Here's a young girl, here's an old man and an old woman and God did the impossible. So God is saying to you, I have not changed. When things look really impossible, when you have an angelic message from someone who looks very ordinary and comes to your house and blesses you and strengthens you, don't think that with man it is impo it's impossible. Uh, I don't think how this can ever work. Get ready, get ready. What God brings a message. And today you're hearing a message from God. That God is ready. He's saying my people don't know that I've got all these resources ready to help them. They go to work every day like they are alone. They sit at home like they are being abandoned. They feel like they are the most uh, misunderstood, uh, uh, hurt people in the universe. And yet all around them, I have encamped around them to tell them I am for you. I am for you, my kid. I love you. I've sent these angels to take care of you. So come back to Abraham. Oh, this man cannot have children. Angel says, you're going to have a child by this time. Such and such a time. His wife in the, in the kitchen there, she starts laughing. The angel says, why do you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. He said, yes, you laugh and you will have a child. And so his name is Isaac move forward. Isaac means laughter. Isaac grows up, but you see, before they had Isaac, which was the promised child, Sarah, Abraham's wife, said, look, he has promised, but as you can see, I'm barren. I cannot have any children. I want you to go and sleep with my maid, Hagar, and let her have your child. This is in the Bible. Hello. These are our heroes in the Bible, okay? Naughty boys and naughty girls saved by the grace of God. So don't you emulate them and put a halo around them. They are just as rascals like you and I. So when his wife said, Husband, go and sleep with my maid. Abraham threw down the remote control, threw down the newspaper and says, I feel God is speaking my heart. I should go now. And off he goes and they, they have this child. Till today, it's a child of God. His name is Ishmael. 
Till today, Israel and the Arab world are brothers that hate each other's guts. But there was a time when Ishmael was growing up and Isaac was still uh, uh, small and uh, Hagar used to always, you know, you know, typical women know how to, my son's better than your son, like, you know, you're so old, I feed my own child with real milk, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and so Sarah got really mad, kicked her out of the house, told her husband, see, the power of women, my goodness. Get her out of the house, she's an irritant. So Abraham takes Hagar and Ishmael out in the wilderness with just a few days of water and some rations. She's out in the wilderness, left to die. As she is dying there, last drop of water, the Bible tells us, and you can read this in Genesis, you can read the whole wonderful, it's a wonderful story of God's grace. Genesis chapter 21, write that down. So, Hagar takes the baby, Ishmael, puts him under a bush, and she goes away quite far because she don't want to see her son die. She's sitting in the sun, waiting to die. Ishmael is dying under the bush, and the angel of the Lord comes. And says, don't cry anymore. And he opens her eyes and she has a well. Now you've got to understand the commodity of water is more precious than gold or diamonds of silver. Until today, the Arab world are digging wells. It's because when God blessed, he never took away his blessing. Now, the problem with Israel is a brother problem. You Chinamen, you Indians, you whatever, it's not your problem. It's their problem. God will sort it out to them, in, sort it out with them the last days. Anyway, coming back to the story. Isaac, the promised child, grows up. And the Bible says, and Abraham, now realizing his son is of age, he calls his servant Eliezer. And he says, I want you to put your hand under my thigh, which was a way of saying, I swear, you know, I, I be cursed if I don't do what. He said, I want you to go out and find a wife for my son, Isaac. Do not let her marry, don't let him marry any of these heathen women. They might be beautiful, but they're not following God. I don't want my son to be following women who don't have any regard or any background with God. So this man swears to his master. He goes out and he says, God, what is the sign that you will give me? So many women in the world. Who is the one that I should find? And Abraham said this, as you go, the Lord has already sent an angel. Genesis chapter 24, verse 7. The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house, Abraham said, from the land of my family, who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, to your descendants I give this land. He will send his angel before you. And you will take a wife for my son from there. And so here the Bible tells us that Abraham had confidence that as this servant would go out, the angel had already gone out in front of him. So this Eliezer goes to a place and he sees all these girls coming out. You know, all giggling little girls, all really nice with their water pots and all of that. Gorgeous. I want you to know that when God, guys, if you're single, that God, when he wants you to marry someone, please don't think that you have to marry this ugly thing. God wants you to marry pretty girls. Amen. That's the difference. Sorry, my wife is not here. I must be missing her a lot. <laughs> oh man, what am I saying? But it's true. It's absolutely true. So listen. So he goes out there. All these girls come out. And they all got watering pots. And, and, and the Eliezer says, Well, the sign that she will be the one that will marry my boss's son. No, my boss is very, very rich. Abraham by now is a billionaire. And so is Isaac, his son. He said, the sign is, not only will she just offer me a drink of water, which was the culture in those days when they see a stranger. He said, not just offer me a drink of water, but will water my camels as well. Now, you've got to understand, these are pretty women. And they're nice. So, they all come out. Rebecca sees... Elias is standing there and he says, oh sir, can I offer you some water? And he's very thankful. And she says, and while you're having this drink of water, can I water all your camels? Now he had about 12 camels. One camel drinks about 140 gallons of water. This woman is stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger pulling out water from the, you know, they didn't have a tap that turned. She's getting this water. She's 
putting her hair up, rolling up her sleeves. She's a hard-working, beautiful, gorgeous girl that the angel had gone to prepare. Ladies, I just want to say this to you, that God blesses women who want to be housewives or want to be workers in whatever situation you might be. In, in Proverbs 31, uh, this is an amazing scripture for all of you ladies here today. It says your husband will bless you. Imagine this guy, Eliezer, looks at her. She's pouring water, no strings attached. She doesn't know that in all these camels are the dowry. Gold and silver and precious stones. She doesn't know. She wasn't doing it for, she had no idea. And the man of her dreams was waiting for her. And she would be a millionaire for the rest of her life. She didn't know. Now we know because we read the Bible. But she didn't know. She poured all the water and this man says, can I see your family? She says, yeah, come meet my parents. He comes over and he opens this gifts and he's a smart guy. First person he gave the gifts to was the girl's mother. Ah, here's a secret boy. If you get mommy, you get everything. Yeah, yeah, all the doors will open. Puts all the gifts there and they said, where? And he tells the story of how his master sent it and the Lord has prepared. And of course, he said, I cannot force her to come. She has to have consent by now. She's saying, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. And off she goes, riding into the sunset to meet the man of a dream. Here's the woman that the Bible talks about. This you might be thinking, how's this attached to angels? Well, ladies, I've said you are not angels. You are God's princesses. It says this in, in Proverbs 31. Talks about the woman of great virtue. Verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts in her. So he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil. All the days of her life, she seeks wool and flax. In other words, she, she, she knows how to handle the accounts in the house. By the way, ladies, if you can't handle the accounts in the house, don't. But if you can, they are one of the best accountants you can ever have, guys. If they are good at it. And willingly works with her hands. In other words, she can work. She can go out and get a job. Bless the women who get jobs outside or are full-time house homemakers. Bless them. But either way, she is like the merchant ship. She brings her food from far. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maid servants. Oh, she gets along with everybody. She doesn't bitch around, fight the maids and fight with them. Ah, she knows how to win everybody. Everybody knows this is the boss's woman. She considers a field and buys it. From her profit, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arm. She goes to the gym sometimes. I'm just saying. And her lamb does not go out by night. She stretches her hand, stretches her hand to the distaff, and her hand holds the spindle. She expands her hand to the poor. She reaches out her hand to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household. For all her household is clothed in scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known at the gates. And he sits among the elders of the land. And she makes linen garments and sells them. And supplies sashes for merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also. And he praises her, guys. He praises her. Ladies, I'm setting you up for Christmas. Ah. This guy knew how to give her gold. Decked her up. Because she's a woman of strength. Covered her with fine linen. Jewelry. Anything, sweetheart. Anything. 
I've always said that, guys, we ought to spoil our women the best that we can. And all the ladies say, I'm helping you girls. Come on, you need to help me preach. Why? It all started with a man saying, I want my son to find a good wife. And she was. And he says, I know it can't be done unless an angel went before. Let me close by just saying this. All these nice things about you women. Oh, I like this last few verse in verse 30. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands. And let her own works praise her in the gate. I want our women in our church to be treated with respect and dignity. Not because they, you know, see some, the way some men talk to their women. That's not nice. Treat them with love. Spoil them. Get them what you can afford. When you can afford. Some of you are going to be probably buying this CD today. So you can let your husband listen. So he's in the car when he cannot stop. When you're on your way to Penang for three hours, he has to hear this. <laughs> Here's the point. I want all you businessmen and businesswomen, I want to challenge you. The next time you go out to make a big deal, I'm not talking about your, just your daily work, I'm talking about when you're going out and there's going to be a really big deal, pray a prayer of faith. God, please go before me. Send your angel ahead of me. Help me, Lord. You don't command God. You'd say, God, help me. I need your help. Send your angel, Lord. Sort out the things so that when I get there, it's prepared. It's prepared. It's prepared. David said, you prepare for me a table in the presence of my enemy. I want to challenge you business people. We live in a crooked world. We've got all kinds of bad spirits and Fallen angels, who cares? God is for you. God is with you. Sends his angels for you. Because he loves you. He loves you. You are the apple of his eye. Today, if you don't know him personally, I challenge you. Open your heart and say, God, I invite you into my life. I trust you. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Give him that opportunity to start working the miracles in your life. This is no magic show. He's no dog. You know, you don't ring a bell and he comes to serve you. He is God. And the Bible says that all these things are possible because you fear him and you respect him and you honor him and give him the glory of what is rightfully his. Let's stand as we close together. Amen. Have you received this? Do you receive this word today? Amen. All right. Wonderful. Firstly, let's pray for those of you who want to ask Jesus to come into your life as Lord and Savior. Remember, we are not asking an angel to be our God. They are created beings. You're asking Jesus, who is the creator of all creation, to be the Lord of all and the King of all. I want us to pray out loud together as a church family, especially for those who have never invited Jesus to be the Lord of their lives. I want us to close our eyes, bow our heads in prayer. I want us to pray out loud. Pray out like this. Lord Jesus, I receive you into my life. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I recognize outside of you, I'm lost. I'm a sinner. But I receive you as my Savior. Cleanse me from all my sin. Make me your child from this day onward. You are my God. I am your child. I give myself to you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name I pray. Amen. I want us to be in an atmosphere of worship. I want us to know how much angels worship God and adore Him because He is the darling of heaven. And I want us to just worship and adore him and praise him as we sing this worship chorus together. Amen.